different, very, very distinct. And what Green Development is doing there is working with the town council. There's three ordinances that are being presented in the town of Exeter. One was by the planning board, one was with the town council, and one is, is actually one in conjunction with the developer and uh, Exeter. So there's a, a great deal of distinction there. It's, it's not one or the other. Um, so I think that that's important. And again, um, let me end with this. There are 39 cities and towns. There are 39 city town councils. Everyone does their thing differently because it's very local. And what we're doing here is specific and particular to the local landowners and to the local ordinances and making sure it all comports with your comprehensive plan. Because your comprehensive plan is nothing like the town of Exeter, nor is it like anything in Smithfield or Oster or any of those other neighborhoods. That's what makes North Smithfield unique, and that's why you have to review it within the confines of what is North Smithfield. With Richmond, uh, Michelle has been dealing with that issue extensively to address that. Yeah, before I get on to Richmond, actually, I wanted to address some of the other um, comments that were specifically raised. Um, so it's important to note that, um, that the town does have an ordinance in place that allows for development of uh, much smaller projects. Um, so this ordinance, as drafted, was specifically designed to address larger projects, which was part of the reason for the minimum parcel size. Um, in addition to that, um, it's worth understanding that there, there have been changes throughout this process, and there will continue to be changes throughout this process. Unfortunately, that is just part of how the development um, process of some of these projects go. Um, we start out with a piece of land, we look at it, we see what it can fit. Um, there's changes in technology, panels get more efficient. It allows us to fit a little bit more on the same parcel of land. Um, wetlands get delineated and we figure out where actual edges are and we're able to change and hone our layout. Um, we talk to the planning board, they want you know, certain alleyways for access, the fire department, things like that. Um, that. That was part of the reason why we switched from saying you know, it was just a 40 megawatt project to um, providing a range. We, we really want you know, the town to understand that this will be an iterative process. Um, and unfortunately, that is just part of the process. We will go through it, we will end up with a system size, um, and we will go through the process with the town council to ensure that um, the numbers, which, which you know, we did start at 6,000 per megawatt on a tax basis, but at the first planning board meeting, we actually verbally said, um, we've, we can offer 7,000, we wanna be consistent across the state. Um, so anyone who's at the planning board meeting can attest to the fact that that was shared verbally. Um, one of the other challenges that was raised on was interconnection um, and you know the, the fact that we're going to make a windfall, I think, with something like the description on this project. Um, what we're actually proposing to do here is to um, build a new substation. So while there is you know, transmission very close to the project, um, there, there will need to be significant utility infrastructure developed uh, in order to um, host the facility that we are proposing to host here. Um, and then the other piece in regards to Richmond, uh, what happened in Richmond is essentially we started construction, um, we started it in the fall, we thought the construction was going to take us a little less time um, than it did end up taking us. We ended up in the winter conditions and um, ended up with a situation where we were not able to stabilize the site until the spring. Um, we're now in the process of stabilizing the site. Uh, we're working with DEM, we're working with the town planner, we met with the neighbors, uh, and we have a plan in place and it should be done within the next two to three weeks, um, at which point that project um, will be completely closed out and there will be no more ongoing um, erosion issues. Thank you. Mr. Denunzio. Thank you, members of the council. My name is Mario Dunzio, and for uh, candor, uh, I am a neighbor of this project. I live on Jefferson Road and have been there for 50 years. I think that makes me a newcomer in Ross Smithfield. Um, also, for candor, uh, I should note that I am a member of the zoning board, and this is one of the reasons why I have uh, signed up to speak tonight. I suspect that I'm going to be caught in a crossfire here because I support this project. I would like it to go through because the alternatives are disastrous. On the other hand, I am sympathetic to some of the concerns that have been expressed. Uh, and I think those concerns should be addressed and should be solved. Uh, 
Uh, I address myself to the alternatives. Uh, I'm a little hazy on time. Maybe 10 years ago, 12, 8, I don't quite remember. Uh, but we, I was at a council meeting where we fought back a project concerning Whittleberry Hill to build a, a commercial park there. It would have been a disaster. It would have, it would have cut all the trees down. It would have paved roads. It would have had runoff down into, uh, oh, uh, into Greenville Road. It was a terrible idea, and it's still a viable idea if the zoning is changed. Now, the zoning in the area now is for housing. And I don't know that they would build 76 houses, but even if they build 40 or 50 houses, it'll mean decimating the trees. It'll mean roadways. And you're not going to do a commercial park or an extensive housing area on Whittleberry Hill without extending sewer lines and water from where they exist now in a short area of Beanville Road all the way up to Whittleberry Hill. That'll cost millions of dollars, and the people along the way are gonna have to pay for part of that uh, because you're not gonna be able to do a commercial park or extensive housing without, you're, you're, not, gonna, you're not gonna dig 60 or 70 wells and 60 or 70 uh, septic systems in that area. It's not large enough for that. So the, the reason that I support, basically support the idea of a solar array on Riddleberry Hill is that the alternatives will be disastrous for the neighborhood and I believe for the town. The argument for the commercial park is that it would raise all kinds of taxes. Well, you folks know that Lincoln and Smithfield have a great deal more commercial development and industrial development than we do. Their taxes are higher than our taxes. The excuse for Dowling Village was that it was going to lower our tax rate because they're going to pay so many, so much in taxes. Our taxes haven't gone down since Dowling Village. They've probably actually gone up because of the extra police and other services that have to be applied. The alternatives to a Pacific solar array will be disastrous. Uh, and so I tend to support the basic project but I have reservations. And the principal reservation is that it cuts out one of the primary safeguards for this town, and that is the zoning board. Uh, I am approaching the end of my service on the zoning board, so I can speak with a little bit of freedom here. Uh, but the zoning board, in my experience, has been a wonderful organization uh, that has protected the town in, in every way, and just recently, is submitted a proposal to the council to lower the application rates for ordinary people applying for variances. We recently had a young couple uh, come for a variance because they wanted to build a garage. It had to be, I don't know, I think 10 feet from the boundary line. They only had seven feet. It cost them $1,200 to make the application. Uh, we, the rezoning board has submitted a proposal to the council to revise all of the rates uh, for applications so that ordinary people can get things done uh, reasonably. The zoning board has served, I must say, modesty aside, the zoning board has served this town very well, and it should not be cut out of this process because it would provide another level of safeguard. Now, the people who have proposed, uh, made, made the pitch for the project, uh, talked about all kinds of conditions. Well, those conditions should not have blanket approval up front. Those conditions should have approval as they are proposed. Therefore, I would recommend that the proposal be approved, but it be uh, amended to provide for a final observation, a final review by the zoning board for any alterations to the project as it goes along. For example, as I check the, uh, the current uh, zoning regulations, uh, they're, they're asking for an exemption from section 5.7.5 D1 of the uh, rules. As I read it, that cancels the 100 foot setback. Do we really want to leave the setback up to the developers? Unless I'm reading it wrong, it, 
that provision provides for a 100 foot setback. Uh, do we want that? They talked about uh, planting uh, uh, friendly uh, trees and shrubbery and so forth around the project. Uh, that, when it comes time to do that, that should be a proposal that goes to the board. The board can always say, we approve this project on the condition that. And then we set conditions that such and such, so many feet uh, be set back, that uh, there's so much greenery, so tall greenery be planted. We have done that. Uh, the board, uh, not too long ago, approved uh, a, 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 solar, a small solar array in Forestdale. We approved it on the condition that certain requirements be met. Uh, and, and that's the way it should proceed. As I read this, there's an exception for noise. There's an exception for decommissioning bonds. Now in 25 years, if they want to give up this project, they can just walk away. Then it will be the town's expense to clean it up. They should, they should not be exempt from a decommissioning bond. Uh, and that's another provision that if the proposal came to the zoning board, it would be approved on the condition that such and such a bond be approved. So again, I endorse the program. I endorse the idea of a solar array on Whittleberry Hill. It would do, it would do the least environmental damage for the potential that that hill could be used for, especially with commercial or industrial development, even with housing development. I'm sorry that they're going to cut a lot of trees, but look around the town. I've been here long enough to remember when there were a lot of farms in town. Uh, there are more trees growing in North Smithfield and New England now than there were during the American Revolution. Because New England and Rhode Island, this was farm country. All of that land was cleared of trees. It's too bad that they have to cut the trees down, but what are they going to replace the trees with? Passive solar array displays. If there is water runoff, it's going to be into pervious ground. You're not going to get a great deal of flooding on, uh, in the marshland or on Greenville Road. Uh, it would be nice. The ideal would be to sell all of that land to a conservancy and leave it pristine. That's not going to happen uh, unless somebody here has enough money to. Uh, I'll, I'll collect for the project if someone here has enough money to uh, put the land in conservancy. That's not going to happen. The alternatives are going to be disastrous. The, the, the prudent thing is to let the project go with the kind of care that Mr. Rapko has suggested in terms of contract and with another layer of ongoing supervision, not a blanket approval, but ongoing supervision, and that would be the role of the zoning board. Thank you. has to be some clarification in regards to the provisions that we're requesting. Uh, we're not asking for section 5.D1 to be eliminated in its entirety. But what we're saying is that the section is not applicable for those projects that actually transcend multiple property lines. So if they're internal property lines, meaning that if the solar array encompasses more than one parcel, uh, then the requirement of the, of the 100 feet for the property line doesn't apply to internal lines. Uh, it's still applicable, which is not to internalize. The, the majority of the issues really are uh, issues that require meticulous review in the project. And the proposal that we're saying is not that it doesn't become reviewed or that we're asking for a blanket approval. That, will never, that can never be made. What we're asking is that the process be uh, vented and filtered by way of the planning board as a major land development project, then returning to the town council to work through the issues regarding development incentives and the issues regarding decommissioning. Uh, those would be subjects for the town council to review. Importantly, the zoning board, even if we went to the zoning board, the zoning board does not have continuous review of the project. The actual body that has continuous review of the project is the planning board. 
Because any changes made to a plan would have to be reviewed by the planning board. It's never reviewed by the zoning board. The zoning board's role, even under your own ordinance, is very, very uh, tailored to the issuance of the special use permit, which is a finding of five prongs that need to be met. Unlike the planning board, which has a much, much broader review. That's why I'm saying or using the word redundancy is because I think that what, this board, what, what we're doing is eliminating a section that really only adds a level of bureaucracy and going straight through a process with the town planner, the planning board, and the town council, and ultimately your finance director to put a package together that makes sense for, for everybody involved. So um, I think that's what we're proposing. I know that's what we're proposing. Thank you. As he addressed my uh, statement, may I respond? Sure. Everything that the planning board does comes to the zoning board if it involves a variance from zoning. And that's the point. The zoning board might approve something in general, but if that approval has to do with a zoning regulation, it ought to come to the zoning board, as it does now. Almost everything, almost every proposal that comes to before the zoning board has already been to the planning board. That's the process. The, the planning board's function is to see to it that a proposal conforms to the general plan for the town. If it does, they approve it. But even if it conforms, if the proposal conforms to the general plan for the town, it may require some variation of a zoning rule. And that's why there ought to be a second layer of review. Thank you. Two seconds. I'm sorry, but, but I, he's absolutely correct. He's absolutely correct, and we're not changing that. So any variance that we would be required to obtain, we still have to re be required to obtain. So we're not saying that this is a blanket approval. Um, so if there is a deviation from your zoning ordinance, we would 100% be required to go to the zoning board. Um, if there's a deviation from the special from the regulations of the planning board, they stay at the planning board. So we're not, we're not circumventing the zoning board in that process. We're not changing use variances and we're not changing dimensional variances. All we're saying is that the special use permit requirement is not necessary. And special use is defined as a conditional permitted use. Thank, Thank you. you. take into consideration the following questions. 
has this developer evaluated any other more appropriate sites in town that 